for a number of years. There have been just three executions in India since the informal moratorium in 1995. In 2004, and more recently in November 2012 and February this year. In addition to the resumption of executions in 2012, this year India also expanded the scope of offences which attract the death penalty. India has also voted against UN General Assembly resolutions calling for a moratorium or ban on the death penalty. As at the end of last year, there were officially 477 people on death row in India. However, it's estimated that the number is actually between something like 3,000 and 4,000. The length of time prisoners spend on death row before they are executed and the associated psychological impact has recently emerged as a topic of interest in the international debate about the death penalty. In the US, death row inmates typically spend a decade waiting for execution. In some cases, prisoners remain on death row for over 20 years. Time spent on death row in the US is one of the main reasons countries such as Canada and the UK are refusing to extradite suspects to face capital charges in the US. Death row phenomenon is the term used to describe the cruel, inhuman and degrading effects of a person spending an extended period of time on death row. In the US, a death row phenomenon claim will be found on the Eighth Amendment bar on cruel and unusual punishment in the US Constitution. However, past efforts have met with little success. It is the international community which has been more favourable to such claims. Under international law, Article 7 of the ICCPR prohibits torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Other human rights treaties contain a similar prohibition, including the Convention Against Torture, the European Convention on Human Rights, the American Convention on Human Rights, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Arguably, the prohibition against cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment has attained binding force under customary international law. The UN Human Rights Committee's interpretation of Article 7 includes consideration of its application to the death penalty. It has said, when the death penalty is applied, it must be carried out in such a way as to cause the least possible physical and mental suffering. It has also said that prolonged incarceration on death row may constitute an Article 7 violation, bearing in mind the imputability of delays in the administration of justice on the state party, the specific conditions of imprisonment in the particular um, penitentiary, and their psychological impact on the person concerned. Over the last two decades, a rich body of international jur jurisprudence has developed in support of the death row phenomenon claim. For example, in Surrey in the UK, the European Court of Human Rights has held that where a condemned prisoner has to endure for many years the conditions on death row and the anguish and mounting tension of living in the ever-present shadow of death, that this is a violation of the prohibition against inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. In Pratt and Morgan, the Privy Council held that a delay of 14 years between conviction and execution in the case of a Jamaican prisoner was inhuman punishment. The Privy Council further said that in any case in which execution is to take place, more than five years after sentence, there will be strong grounds for believing that the, that, that the delay amounts to inhuman or degrading punishment. In the case of the Minister of Justice and Burns, the Canadian Supreme Court, in deciding whether to extradite two men to the U.S. to face capital charges, considered evidence that death row inmates in the U.S. state of Washington took, on average, 11.2 years to complete their appeals. The court acknowledged the widening acceptance that the finality of the death penalty, combined with the appeal process, seems inevitably to provide lengthy delays and the associated psychological trauma. The Uganda Supreme Court has also embraced these arguments. In the case of Susan Kigula and 416 others, the court held that a delay beyond three years after a sentence was confirmed by the highest appellate court would tend towards unreasonable delay, and that a delay of five years beyond the final appeal was unconstitutional. The Zimbabwe Supreme Court has held that delays of 52 and 72 months between the imposition of a death sentence and execution amount to inhuman punishment. 
Just as was the case of the execution of juveniles and the mentally ill, it is essential that courts worldwide continue to be made aware of international standards with regard to death row phenomenon, so that they may take them into consideration in light of the evolving standards of decency. The Indian Supreme Court's recent affirmation of the death sentence in Professor Buller's case is inconsistent with these international standards that have been developed in relation to death row phenomena. Furthermore, the recent resumption of executions in India and the widened scope of capital offences is an alarming development which goes against global trends in the application of the death penalty. We are very keen to support Professor Buller and assist his legal team to ensure that his death sentence is properly commuted. We are also very keen to do what we can to bring about the abolition of the death penalty in India. Please reach out to us at Reprieve. Our website is www.reprieve.org.uk. Alternatively, you can obtain our contact details from the Human Rights Law Network. Thank you. I was usually not supposed to speak, and I was requested to speak. Just want to touch two or three issues. The first issue is, I think there is a general perception that most people in the country want that penalty. But actually, if it is to carry out all the death penalties which are imposed each year by the courts in India, I think there will be huge public revulsions against that penalty. It's precisely because of the fact that you know, the, because the government doesn't actually execute people, the debate actually doesn't take place. And when we looked at the data of the National Crime Records Bureau, uh, we had found out and we had stated that for the year 2001 to 2011, about 5,776 people were given death penalty by the courts. So that's a huge number, almost 6,000 people. And out of these, about 4,321 cases were commuted, and 1,455 cases were confirmed. So it basically means in India, every third day there is a confirmation of death penalty. And the number of death penalty given by the lower courts is quite high. And this figure which I am talking about, which is given by the NCRB, that about 5,776 persons who are given death penalty, it was prior to the judgment uh, which was given by the Supreme Court uh, in which in both the cases Justice Makunde Karju was involved, uh, asking uh, that in all cases of uh, owner killings, they should be treated as rare as in the rare cases and therefore death penalty should be imposed. And as well as in 2010, again a judgment by the Martin Nikaju saying that in the dowry death cases too, death penalty should be imposed. And once this judgment, these two judgments came from the Supreme Court, I still remember there were a number of judgments. Almost in all the dowry death cases as well as uh, honor killing cases, that penalty was being imposed. So you can imagine the number of that penalty cases, the way they have gone up. And if we are to take the figures of the uh, National Crime Records Bureau as the average figure of about 5,600 cases per year, so if we are to actually look at every decade, then we have 5,600 cases. Now, if you take back to 1980, we would actually be having at least minimum 15,000 cases in which that penalty has been given, and at least in 4,500 cases, that penalty has been confirmed. So you could see the number of people actually from 1995 onwards, very few people were executed. And if the government of India is to resume execution from tomorrow onwards, you could see that almost every day they have to carry out that penalty, possibly two or three people in a day, if they want to complete all the executions of the people who have been given or whose sentences have been confirmed. I do not think the society in India actually ready to accept that penalty like Saudi Arabia every day. Sometimes there are outrage against heinous crimes, but also I don't think we have reached a stage where you actually accept uh, that penalty uh, every uh, second day. So there is a serious problem with this scale. And I just want to refer to one particular case which was referred by uh, the 
the representative from Amnesty International, as well as Colin Gonzalez, in one particular case where, in the same facts and circumstances with respect to Harban Singh, uh, one person was actually executed, the other person was acquitted, and the third person, which came up in 1982, Harban Singh, where Supreme Court had actually recommended for the president to consider the mercifully or pardon him when we got the recent RTI reply from President's office from 1980 till uh, 2012 31st March Harban Singh's name is not anywhere you can check in our website the list of the people who have been pardoned since 1980 and Harban Singh's name is not there possibly he was not even able to move the mass petition so there are lots of people whose sentences are confirmed at the High Court level and at the level of the Supreme Court who do not have the resources to approach or the governor or the president of India and they are just languishing in jails. So if you have been given at the age of say 20, 25 in 1970, you might still be alive, rotting in the jails. Oh, God knows wherever they are. So the fact that the, the, there is no maintenance of data as to how many virtual convicts we have in this country is actually one of the state secrets and it actually prevents a, a debate which uh, should be taking place in the country as to the efficacy of that penalty or whether we should have that penalty or not. The second comment which I wanted to make is specifically with respect to the case of Professor Bula. Uh, it's accepted in the Indian Evidence Act, it's accepted under the Internal Covenant and Civil and Political Rights, that one cannot incriminate himself or herself. So it basically means you cannot give a statement saying I am guilty, I have committed the crime. It's for the prosecution to prove the corroborative evidence that he has committed the crime. And in this particular case, the only statement which on who, based on which he has been convicted is basically his confessional statement. Having said that, I think the key issue is now that we have uh, the judgment of uh, the Supreme Court in the mass execution of Gula as well as Mahindra Nath Das, there are two questions. One, what's the threshold to decide that delay constitutes a ground for communication? Should it be one year? Should it be two years? Ten years? Twenty years? What's the threshold? That threshold has not been decided in both the cases. The second issue is somebody given that penalty uh, by the Supreme Court. Everybody is equal before the law. Because the basic principle for giving that sentence is the rarest of the rare principle. That's the doctrine. So all the people who are convicted based on rarest of the rare doctrine, among themselves, they become equal. And now when the Supreme Court says that in the case of Tada or the terror offences, they do not deserve any mercy. I do not think that is something which exists in the law. We possibly cannot question it in the call for contempt of court, but this is absolutely illegal. Because once you have been given, who is to